Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome all the participants to the virtual conversation, an introduction to FP2030 commitments. My name is Chong Hee Huang, and I am Senior Manager for Asia and Anglo and Africa with FP2030 Secretariat. Today, is we, have, uh, we, we are having almost uh, like 150 participants. We're expecting more to join us across the globe. We are very excited and grateful for all your interest and eagerness to discuss the new commitments. Uh, this webinar is a streaming on YouTube as well. Uh, so please feel welcome to drop any questions or comments on YouTube Live too. Now I'd like to invite Bas Slokter, uh, Executive Director of EP2030 for welcome remarks. Hello, everyone, and thank you, Chung Hee, for the introduction. I want to welcome everybody to today's kickoff webinar for commitments for the FP2030 partnership. If you've been a part of this partnership, and many of you have since 2012, you know that commitments are really at the heart of what we do. It's the articulation of everyone's desire within your own context to expand access to contraception that brings us all together. And that really is the animating spirit of the partnership from all of you working in countries, grassroots organization, feminist women's groups, to the technical partners and the governments who lead these processes on behalf of the people in your countries to again, the global technical experts, the donors, and many of the other partners who come together to support these ambitious goals. We wanna thank you for your partnership and welcome you to the FP2030 process, which doubles down on those things that worked really well for FP2020, including this kind of partnership, but also it has the ambition to expand what we do to make it even more effective by bringing the partnership closer to the countries where all of you are working. So I'm excited that you've all chosen to join us today. I wanna to thank my colleagues at the Secretariat for all of their work in partnership with all of you to craft this toolkit uh, for commitments. I think it's a first of its kind in our sector and I hope that it will become a best practice and that you'll help us to continue to refine it as we all start to use it together in the coming months. So thank you again for joining us today. Thank you to my colleagues in the Secretariat. And with that, back over to you, Chung Hee, to kick us off. Thank you very much, Beth. Um, in today's discussion for the next 90 minutes, we're going to share the overview of IP2030 Commitment Toolkit and introduce the uh, two country government commitments and non-state partners commitments. And we will invite two countries and two non-state partners for a panel discussion, which will be followed by questions and answers towards the end of today's program. Uh, now, I'd like to turn it over to my colleague, Dilly Severin, Senior Director of FP2030 Secretariat for an overview of the Commitment Toolkit. Over to you, Dilly. Thanks so much, Chang Hee. Good morning, good evening uh, to everyone. Uh, thanks again for joining us. We're gonna be talking quite a bit about the FP2030 Commitments Toolkit today as the, the basis of our discussion. Um, and so what is this toolkit? Um, it is guidance developed for our government and our non-governmental commitment makers. The tool right now uh, is a web-based tool that was um, crafted as Beth indicated uh, through extensive collaboration with with many in the in the community, um, and so we are we're really excited to to talk about this today. Um, what exactly does the toolkit cover? Um, it really articulates the value of making an FP2030 commitment. Um, it provides some best practice examples to strengthen the ownership and content of commitments. Um, and you'll see as we, we move along today, um, it does outline some recommended steps for making and launching a commitment. Again, these are recommended, um, not uh, prescribed. Um, it also provides recommendations to foster and strengthen accountability. Um, and as, as Beth was indicating, um, you know, FP2020 uh, and now FP2030 has a long history of, of garnering commitments. Um, and always we provided some guidance, mostly in one-on-one -on -one, uh, consultations and other more direct um, interactions with our commitment makers. So this was just the first time uh, we pulled together 
all of the guidance in one place. Uh, and I think part of that is also driven just by the nature of the, the new partnership, the fact that we, we anticipate many more governments and, and non-governmental commitment makers um, to be potentially making commitments and wanted to have this um, cohesive resource that would be available to all. Uh, next slide, please. All right, for those of you who are quite familiar with, our, with the FP2020 uh, commitment making process and, and the guidelines provided uh, related to that, I wanted to spend some time highlighting how the FP2030 commitments toolkit and the guidance within is different from the past. So first, it really reflects the country led and country driven mandate of the new partnership. Um, Link to that uh, is actually a request that commitments be launched in country and then we will celebrate them at the global and regional levels. Uh, includes a really strong focus on inclusion, transparency and accountability, but of course continues to be anchored in data and rights based principles. Um, the guidance seeks to strengthen accountability within the commitments process for all, all governments um, and including donors and other partners. And of course, we continue to encourage alignment with national and global frameworks. Next slide, please. Where does this tool live? Um, so you can find it at www.commitments.fp2030.org. Uh, the site was actually soft launch on February 8th, um, but not necessarily publicly shared um, uh, until a little bit later. And part of that was because we were doing some technical testing, but we also wanted to make sure that it would be available for all commitment makers in English and French, which it is right now. And we knew based on the timelines that had been communicated both by our government and our non-governmental commitment makers that um, having a soft launch, doing a little bit of testing and having this conversation today would not result in any loss of momentum. So I encourage you to check out the site, um, but we will be talking quite a bit about what the site contains today and the different aspects of the guidance. So I'll pause here uh, and turn over back to my moderator, Changhee. Thank you very much, Dili. Okay, so for the next 10 minutes, I'd like to give you a brief overview of a country government commitments and walk through some of the guidance that you can find on the online commitment toolkit and a few suggested steps we'd focused on the earlier stage of commitment making. So perhaps we can start with a question that some of you may have. Why should a country make a commitment to a P2030 partnership? By making a new or renewed P2030 commitment, your country will help accelerate global, global progress on universal health coverage and the sustainable development goals, collectively transforming the lives of women, girls, and communities for generations to come. Countries will also contribute to and benefit from the largest and most active community of practice on rights-based family planning in the world. A country commitment offers access to an international platform from which your country can demonstrate the leadership, increase visibility of country's effort, learn and exchange with other countries and partner organizations. Commitment making countries will also collaborate with a global community of leaders experts, advocates, and implementers who are working together to address the most challenging barriers to expanding voluntary uh, access to and use of modern contraceptives. This slide lists uh, key principles of country government commitment. First, as the global family planning movement is driven by the core vision that every individual should be able to uh, decide freely and for themselves whether, when, and how many children to have. Anchoring commitments to the EPI 2030 partnership in rights-based principles aims to ensure this vision can be realized for all individuals. A commitment should be also developed and validated through an inclusive, equitable, and transparent process. As Dilly mentioned earlier, the engagement of multi-sectoral partners, civil society, including young people, and the marginalized groups are key in supporting in the commitments co-creation, execution, and accountability me mechanisms. In particular, EPI 2030 is proud to have CSO and youth focal points in nearly all commitment-making countries of EPI 2020 um, as equal members alongside the government and donors. 
Uh, we'd like to emphasize that AP2030 and the CSO and news focal points are dedicated to inclusiveness and bringing uh, in a wider representation of CSOs and youth. AP2030 support of this uh, is reflected in the commitment guidance in overall and our effort to coordinate support for broad uh, CSO and youth engagement in commitment making and accountability processes. EPI 2030 commitments should also align with the country's other global and regional partnership and frameworks, as well as national plans. Uh, commitments should be also grounded in available data and evidences. Next slide, please. Then what should be included in the EPI 2030 commitment? On the commitment guidance toolkit for country governments, a uh, commitment form can be downloaded from the website. And uh, all you, uh, as you will see in the form, uh, it is consisted with three main sections, which starts with a vision statement, then it describes the changes your country hopes to bring about in the lives of women, girls, and their families through the commitment by 2030. Secondly, commitment objective would outline what would contribute to the achievement of vision in what timeline and what kind of a strategies. Uh, those ob objectives can be aligned with the five focused areas of EP 2030 partnership where possible. And the third main section is an accountability approach, which Dilly mentioned briefly earlier. This section is where you will describe how the government and partners will work together to ensure sustained and transparent progress towards the commitment objectives. So speaking of the accountability, we've added the accountability guidance to the commitment toolkit for country governments. As mentioned in previous slides, the guidance highlights the focus on accountability in all phases of commitment making process and the role of civil society, including young people, in designing, strengthening accountability mechanisms and tracking implementation of commitments. The accountability guidance includes specifically uh, a suggested framing of mutual accountability, uh, accountability guiding principles, which we, uh, we are encouraging countries to take into consideration. And examples of a promising accountability mechanism we are recommending at the national and subnational levels, and also other additional resources. Uh, so please note that we are not suggesting one accountability mechanism, recognizing all countries have different context. The examples and recommendations that we provide on this guidance are for countries to consider based on each context and needs. Also, we are not asking countries to design uh, to new uh, accountability mechanisms, which they have already, uh, I mean, if they have already one in place. For those countries, we would encourage to see if there are any other accountability structures, such as ICPD plus 25 or GFF that can be aligned. We would also encourage to strengthen or expand the accountability approach uh, to a sus uh, subnational level where uh, needed. On the commitment toolkit, you will also find the briefs that provide each specific context and recommendation on key thematic topics, which would inform commitment making. Uh, those key themes include domestic financing fi uh, family planning, emergency preparedness, response and resilience, postpartum and post-abortion family planning, and family planning immunization integration, supply chain strengthening, and use and adolescent. Uh, more guidance will be written and added, so uh, we would welcome and appreciate your suggestions on any other additional thematic guidance that can be useful. Uh, we are also planning a specific session or uh, calls on thematic areas uh, and further details are forthcoming. Um, this slide lays out nine steps that are recommended for countries to consider for commitment making process. Uh, these recommended steps are built on feedback from a range of partners and informed by the lesson learned from co commitments made under EPI 2020 partnership. 
Uh, those steps are only indicative and we encourage each country to adapt it to fit in in uh, its overall plan, building on each respective uh, circumstances, context that needs at the country level. Uh, in the planning phase, we encourage countries to consider to take three steps as outlined on the left side of this slide, uh, starting from creating a plan for engagement of stakeholders and partners, securing buy-in from key decision makers, and developing an overall commitment roadmap. Uh, in the development phase, five steps can be considered, including review of current progress in family planning, as you, uh, you can see on step four, uh, setting country goals, step five, developing an accountability plan, step six, and sharing a commitment draft for validation feedback, which is step seven, and submit a finalized commitment, which is step eight on this slide. And then the commitment will be launched at the country level, which can be amplified at regional and global level as indicated in the step nine. Today, I will introduce the first five steps in a little bit of more details, given uh, that we understand most of the countries are currently in those earlier uh, phases. Uh, for the later steps, please visit the toolkit website for more guidance. So as you can see on this slide, step one of the commitment making is to identify key stakeholders and create a stakeholder engagement plan. Uh, this can be started by establishing an inclusive commitment steering committee or utilizing an existing inclusive body such as a family planning technical working group or country engagement working group with clear terms of reference. It will be also critical to include the input and voice of CSO and young people in this committee. This will foster a strong sense of partnership, transparency, and inclusiveness throughout the commitment process. Uh, it will also help set clear expectations in terms of leadership, share the ownership, and also mutual accountability. Step two is to secure buy-in from government decision makers. Securing buy-in from government decision makers, especially non-health ministries, is strategically important for the development of strong commitment. Um, early involvement of government stakeholders at multiple levels and within multiple ministries uh, will ensure active participation throughout the commitment drafting, launch, and implementation processes. Uh, many countries already have a strong intergovernmental uh, relationships in support of health priorities. Uh, during the panel discussion later in today's discussion, um, we will invite a country partner to hear their experience and plan for cross-ministerial uh, collaboration. Step three is to consider the development of a comprehensive commitment process roadmap. Uh, developing a roadmap for uh, the uh, commitment process will allow you to prioritize activities with relevant stakeholders to guide a country's transparent and comprehensive commitment process. This roadmap will define country priorities uh, for the commitment process as well as roles and responsibilities. Uh, the roadmap can also serve uh, as a high level communication tool for sharing the commitment process and timeline with relevant stakeholders. While your roadmap should be comprehensive, consider the realistic sequencing, timing, and level of effort allotted to your activities given available resources and level of stakeholder engagement. Mapping and analyzing existing frameworks will be critical. For example, any high level national plans or strategy, global financing facility investment case, and ICPD plus 25 commitments um, and so on, and consider other areas of uh, alignment as well. In the online toolkit, you will find an Excel-based template of a commitment roadmap, which is ready to be used. So please check the one pager on this step three, which is available on the commitment toolkit website. Uh, later in the session, we will hear from a colleague from Zambia how they have developed and utilized the commitment roadmap.
Step four is to review progress of previous commitment. As you may all agree, uh, it is important to review progress made to date uh, to determine the main successes and the areas for further acceleration. Uh, as reference, data analysis, analysis are available on the country pages on the Track 20 website and also EP2030 website, in, including in-depth analysis of opportunities for increasing the modern contraceptive prevalence rate, postpartum family planning uptake, use contraceptive use, and contraceptive method mix. Uh, developing data-driven commitments will also help foster a strong sense of transparency, ownership, and partnership as this step includes a wide and inclusive consultation process. Step five is to draft a vision statement and set commitment objective building on those activities uh, shared on the earlier steps. Uh, you can find more detailed guidance on this step five in the government commitment form, uh, which is available on the Commitment Toolkit website. So I will stop here. Uh, please any, add any questions or comments in, uh, on this uh, country commitments in the chat box uh, so we can discuss more during the Q&A session. Uh, now I'd like to turn it over to Dili to share about the non-state actor commitments. Thanks, Chunky. Um, so I'm going to talk a lot uh, about our um, non-state or non-governmental actor commitments, and I'll have a little bit of a, uh, a couple of slides to talk just a little bit about uh, donor government commitments. Um, so next slide, please. All right, so Chang-hee gave us a really good overview of the, the many ways that um, we are hoping to engage our government commitment makers. So I'm gonna talk about how we, are, we see our engagement with non-governmental stakeholders and commitment makers as part of the commitments process. Um, so there are, there are four types of engagement we, we, we anticipate. So the first is as key national and global commitment makers, especially with the new regional structure, we anticipate that our non-governmental commitment makers will be making commitments um, at the national level as well as at the global level. Um, I've mentioned and Chang Hien has, has, has also flagged again, um, the accountability mechanisms um, that may be part of the government um, commitment making process where relevant, um, we anticipate that our non-governmental commitment makers may align with uh, those uh, country uh, accountability mechanisms. I wanna emphasize here that um, we, we encourage where it makes sense for our non-governmental commitment makers to align with country processes um, and to align with national accountability mechanisms, but they are still free to make global commitments or commitments that go above and beyond um, what might be um, covered as part of the, the, their, their country government commitment. Um, we also, of course, um, see our, our non-governmental stakeholders as recipients of financial and technical support. Um, the Secretariat has been leading work in partnership with many organizations to leverage financial and technical support for civil society and youth-led organizations to participate in government commitment processes, um, and particularly the accountability mechanisms that we've, we've chatted about. Um, and um, that ranges from... Um, actual funding to, to bring um, CSO and youth-led organization partners together to collaborate, to coordinate, um, as well as just technical assistance on specific areas. Um, and that work is ongoing. At the end of this presentation, we'll provide more information about how you can get in touch with us if this is of interest. Um, and the last piece is um, we hope to engage our non-governmental uh, stakeholders as technical experts who may be able to provide feedback on key, aspect of, key aspects of government and other commitments. Next slide, please. All right, so I'm gonna uh, pause a little bit on, on non-governmental non actors to just talk a bit about donor government commitments. Um, so FP2030 is currently working with the Kaiser Family Foundation to develop guidance for donor governments. Um, this is still in progress and we hope to release it soon, um, but some of the, the elements that we're hoping to um, incorporate in this guidance um, include uh, recommendations for, for donor governments to make smart and actionable commitments. Um, 
and for them to also have an inclusive and transparent process for the development, implementation, and an ac accountability around their commitments. We're also encouraging donor governments to make commitments aligned with existing national and global frameworks. Um, and we are thinking about an accountability approach that's centered on self-reporting and global learning, which is quite similar to an approach um, for accountability, as I'll show later, um, for our non-governmental um, commitment makers. Next slide, please. So uh, I mentioned that um, we're hoping to provide guidance to our donor governments that really um, encourages smart content in their commitments. So I wanted to just provide a little bit of a, a snapshot of what we're thinking about when we say that. Um, so this is based on the lessons learned from FB 2020 on commitment tracking and accountability. Um, and so we're recommending the following. Uh, to our donor governments. One, that they think about developing a, a baseline representing the donor's current investment in bilateral assistance for SRHR and within that family planning specifically. Um, we're hoping that our donor governments can outline the amount and expected time period over which they're committing funding for SRHR and hopefully within that, a clear articulation of whether the financial commitment re uh, represents sustained funding at existing levels or new and or additional funding for SRHR. Um, we're also um, thinking about um, asking our donor governments to, to think about and define whether the new and or additional funding amounts represent an annual amount of funding or an amount over a specific period of time and what that time period is. And of course, where relevant for them to outline what might be the priority targeted countries or other geographies um, and other focused priority uh, populations or program areas that are being um, included in their commitment. Next slide, please. All right, so Chang He took us through the steps uh, that are recommended for our government uh, commitment makers. Uh, we also have recommended steps for our non-governmental commitment makers to consider in making their commitment, and there are also nine of them. Um, I won't go through every single one here, but I will highlight a, a few of them. So obviously, you know, step one, um, we're recommending an organizational review of goals and potential engagement with FB 2030. And I want to really emphasize that we have many government, non-governmental um, commitment makers who have their own quite sophisticated processes already in place for how they are going to approach their commitment to FP 2030. So again, none of this is prescriptive. Um, it really is meant to be a guide and a recommendation, especially for perhaps new non-governmental uh, commitment makers who, who have not yet engaged with us in this kind of process. Um, as I mentioned, you know, we are we are encouraging um, organization led consultation and outreach to part other partners where relevant. And if that extends to participating in government um, accountability, uh, government accountability and government commitment processes, that's that's wonderful. Um, and then I, I, we do have at step six, you'll see a non state um, partner commitment checklist, which just is a, a nice uh, guide to help our non governmental commitment makers assess where they are in their commitment making process. And we will share that resource at the end of this, this uh, briefing. Um, and then of course, this takes us to the, the last step of step nine, which is the formal launch of, of the commitment in coordination with FB 2030 where possible. Next slide, please. So I've talked a lot about accountability. Um, obviously, I think, I hope it's coming through quite clearly that accountability is woven throughout this commitment guidance for all our different commitment makers and for our non-governmental commitment makers. There are really two pillars uh, that are part of the accountability approach. One is annual progress monitoring, which should not be too much of a surprise. Um, so our commitment makers, as in the past, commit to participate in an annual self-reporting process. Um, and that self-reporting process is much more more streamlined from the past. Um, and so uh, I think that will be welcome to our non-governmental commitment makers. We heard that quite clearly that that was something that they would appreciate. And the other thing we heard from them um, in terms of reflecting on their engagement as FP 2020 commitment makers was that they wanted more opportunities for learning from each other, but also learning from our government um, commitment makers. So in the 2030 partnership, we are really hoping to provide ongoing opportunities for our non-governmental commitment makers to participate in media and other events and to capture insights from um, other key partners in FB2030 publications and other avenues. Um, we do welcome other ideas on um, what might be other desired opportunities for further engagement of our non-governmental commitment makers in FB2030. 
Next slide, please. So I'll talk a little bit about some of the key metrics that may be captured in the self-reports. Self and there are quantitative and qualitative metrics that we're recommending that our non-governmental um, commitment makers consider. So one is just a quantitative review of, exist, of their existing commitment and progress made against key indicators over the year. So some examples of, of those quantitative indicators could be money dispersed, geographic areas covered, clients reach with services, advocacy messages, and more. Um, and on the qualitative side, um, we're hoping that um, these reflections can capture the value of the partnership, lessons learned, and how to improve collaboration. Um, and so some of what we're hoping to, to, to see is to see examples of coordination, collaboration, or innovation that may have been facilitated by um, a non-state uh, actor's uh, participation in the partnership. Um, we are always curious about how FP2030 can help to achieve success. Um, and any personal or organizational success stories, particularly success stories of how a commitment may have an impact even beyond the family planning sector is always welcome. Next slide, please. All right, so I'll stop uh, and I believe I'm going to turn over to Onyenye now, who's going to lead us through a panel discussion, um, which brings together both government and our non-government commitment makers. Thank you, Dilly. And um, hello, everyone. I hope you can all hear me well. So um, now that we are all familiar with the FP2030 Commitment Toolkit and the nine steps um, on how to make a commitment, how do we exactly put this into practice? So I am um, thrilled to invite our country partners to, um, for a discussion on how countries and our non-state actors have been thinking through their commitment making process and their approaches. So we would like to invite the following people to join me on the virtual stage. Dr. Angel Chisa Muiche, who is the assistant director for the, um, at the reproductive health units in the Ministry of Health in Zambia as well as Mr. Yoram Saime, who is the head of the Advocacy Planning and Development Units at um, Churches Health Association of Zambia. So um, Mr. Yoram is our CSO focal point in Zambia, and Dr. Muiche is our, part, uh, is our representative from the Ministry of Health. And then we also have doc, um, Dr. Dr. Um, John Levado, who is going to be represented by his colleague, Dr. Diego Danila from the Department of Health from the Philippines. And um, we have David Johnson, who is the Chief Executive of Margaret Pike Trust, as well as Dr. Vic Mohan, the Director of Community Health Blue Ventures. So welcome to all of our panelists. We're really glad you could join us this morning or afternoon, wherever you are. All right, so I see Yoram, I see David, I also see Diego, thank you for joining us. All right, my first question will go to Mr. Yoram. As a civil society representative, can you share with us your perspectives on the commitment process thus far in Zambia? Speci specifically, can you tell us about the activities that CSOs have been part of and how you feel the process has been inclusive thus far? Okay, thank you very much. Um, so the background to understanding where we are with the FP 2030 commitments uh, development starts with understanding how we develop the CIP. So before what you are seeing there as identification of members of the task team was that when developing the CIP, which by the way, uh, was completed for Zambia by December, it's fully signed, we're just going forward to print, was that uh, it became logical that this becomes the next stage to what we were doing. And so the first thing we had to identify members of the task team and the key consideration was uh, we had people who took part in the development of the CIP and understood the processes which had gone in and the input. And we also went to look at the previous commitments from the CIP which we had. <laughs> Uh, Zambia had a CIP uh, which was um, uh, effective from uh, 2012 uh, to 2020. So we had eight years to look back and ask ourselves, when we look at the commitments we made, what worked, what didn't work for different uh, reasons. And this led us into a strategic workshop to develop these commitments. And these strategic workshops used uh, bottleneck analysis 
once again to ask ourselves, how will the commitment process help us to achieve our aspirations for the next CIP, which is covering the period 2021 to 2026? We, uh, after this workshop, we went back to the technical working group to present what had happened uh, in, in, in these workshops. And the technical working group gave feedback uh, on what had been developed, uh, which led to uh, going back uh, where we are now, we are essentially uh, at 4.5. So there is a gap between four and five because the family planning technical working group gave feedback and had concerns and additions. So we've gone back at this process what we are doing is really panel beating the commitments to take into consideration the feedback we've had from the technical working group. So, so far, that is what has happened. The important thing to note about the Zambia process is that it has been first and foremost supported. We are very grateful to FP 2030 because um, as much as uh, institutions want to talk about uh, CSOs or uh, civil society, uh, participating or leading some processes, uh, in many instances, we have found that the lack of resources hampers uh, participation, but it also hampers uh, the technical input that they can provide. So FP2030 uh, helped us with processes one, two, three, and where we are right now uh, in terms of 4.5, as I have said, which is not there. Uh, the second thing is that the CIP itself uh, was very democratically developed to the extent that the chairperson of the task team developing the task, uh, the CIP was a civil society person, myself. And uh, from this experience, we were able to determine that even the commitments, we can have shared leadership in developing it. This was completely different from the first uh, development of the commitments, where as civil society, we were more or less at the receiving end of a document which is developed. And we have to figure out how we are going to hold government and other cooperating partners accountable to making things happen. So in this process, we have been part of it. We are determining what the commitments should be and the key criteria being, we need to see what is it that we need, what, what will help us achieve the CIP. So the commitments have to make sense as critical enablers for us to achieve the CIP. Thank you so much, Yoram. We really appreciate you so just walking us through that process, the inclusive process that the Zambia government, um, along with civil society partners and youth groups, have taken to, um, to make the new commitments. And it's important to highlight that the Zambia team created a task team, and then they also reviewed past um, strategic documents, including the CIP, which was recently revised. So thank you very much for sharing that perspective. I don't know if Dr. Muiche is here, but maybe we can hear his thoughts at a later time. I want to invite my colleague, Chong Hee Wang, to pose a, a question to our Philippines um, colleague, Dr. Diego. Thank you, Onyeng Yen. Thank you so much for Mr. Yoram. So, uh, uh, Dr. Diego Danila, we understand the Department, Department of Health of the Philippines is actively planning and discussing to collaborate with the Department of Education uh, with focus on the youth and adolescent program in the country. So would you share a little bit about, about that? Yeah, 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 sure thing. Uh, good evening. It's evening here in the Philippines, exactly 6.45 p.m. And we would like to welcome you. I am Dr. Diego Danilo from the Department of Health, and I would like to share that we had this summit with the Department of Education uh, we have, in which we are, our, our commitment is to reduce teenage pregnancy. One of the main problem of the Philippines is teenage pregnancy. In fact, we have the highest rate of teenage pregnancy in the ASEAN nation. So if you can see here, in 2019, the National Summit to understand the education, health and development dimensions of early pregnancy and forge multi-stakeholder consensus on ways forward, underscores the need for collaborative and effective action by all stakeholders of the country, especially dealing with adolescent pregnancy. This summit 
stem from discussion in the cabinet to address the problem of teenage pregnancy. One of the most pressing problems of the secondary level school students in our public schools. Cognizant of the need for a whole of government and society's approach to teenage pregnancy, the Department of Education in, was instructed by the president to lead the summit in preparation and co partnership with the Department of Health. In response, interagency form core groups and committees, as well as conduct of pre-summit dialogues to learners and parents, key implementers, faith-based organization, civil society organization, young people with the help of other stakeholders. As directed by the Office of the President, the Department of Education and the Department of Health held national summit entitled Kapit Kamai. In English, it called it uh, holding hands together. Empowering, this empowered, this will make the youth empowered to make informed choices. Primarily, this, this was anchored and object, its objective was the conference is to look into the health, education, and development dimensions of early pregnancy and identify multi-stakeholder necessary action point to address the problem. The summit highlights was around 500 participants attended, including government, civil society, faith-based organization, and especially the youth sector. The event featured performance of representatives shared personal experience in overcoming challenges of teenage pregnancy. Five dimensions of early pregnancy were focused, especially education, instilling the importance of education and developing the youth, health, bringing the adolescent mental, sexual, and reproductive health services, child protection, creating safe spaces for children, media technology, reaching the young people through media, and social community dimension, strengthening partnership with the community. The Department of Education in 2019 and to the new FT20 partnership, which states that the physical, mental, and social well-being of adolescent is essential and the promotion of rights, protection, and safety requires multi-sectoral action toward a pre empowered, harmonious society. The issue of adolescent pregnancy is most urgent given its impact on individuals, families, communities, and the nation. The persistently high numbers of adolescent pregnancies connect health, education, economic development, hence the importance of addressing all of these dimensions. The assembly recognizes the importance of education completion as a robust, robust protective factor in addressing adolescent pregnancy, especially among girls. Of health information services to enable adolescents to make informed choice and practice healthy behavior. Joint initiative like the camp, yeah, okay. Joint initiative like the Kamit, Kapit Kamai addresses the fragmentation of adolescent program to advance and prevent teen age pregnancy. Understanding the roles and responsibilities of two agencies like the DOH and the Department of Education leads to complementation of policies, programs, and services. Resource and knowledge sharing with stakeholders advance the promotion of a comprehensive sexuality education and teen pregnancy prevention. Youth engagement and shared vision with adolescent groups will help mainstream reproductive health programs. In order to put in place effective programs and support mechanisms that will empower the youth to make informed choices, the government and other duty bearers should act on the following. Number one, implementing age-appropriate and culturally sensitive comprehensive sexual education. Number two, scaling up of adolescent-friendly health services. Number three, 
guaranteeing that all adolescents complete school, especially girls, ensuring that adolescents have decent and competent, competitive economic opportunities after school. Number five, protecting adolescents from sexual violence, discrimination, and harmful practices. Number six, implementing better support systems for pregnant adolescents and adolescent parents. Number seven, strengthening family relationships, building a caring and nurturing community and society and implementing family development programs, especially geared towards men. Supporting more researches, improving available data on adolescent pregnancy and its determinants and maximizing various media platforms to generate multi-stakeholder engagement to accelerate reduction of adolescent pregnancies in the country. As stipulated in the Declaration of the National Economic Development Authority, the Department of Education, the Department of Health shall jointly lead a whole government approach in translating these corresponding policies, budgets, and programs to rapidly address the issue of adolescent pregnancy in the Philippines. The national government agencies and commissions, local government units, non-government organizations, civil societies in a, must engage in a spirit of partnership and service to ensure that adolescents reach their full potential as empowered and productive citizens and must work together in realizing the spirit content of this declaration. As part of this commitment, the Department of Health should had already issued several focus policy endorsed and shared with the Department of Education. I think that's Thank my you. last slide. I, 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 yeah. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Diego. That was really comprehensive updates from the Philippines. And I was really impressive to hear how two departments formed the core group and joint committee with consultation of many different partners uh, that works as a platform for uh, collaboration and of course for a critical platform for joint commitment making to a 2030 partnership as well. And I think uh, having a common specific goal for the two uh, departments to address the team pregnancy uh, is really critical uh, to realize and strengthen the collaboration between two departments. So I'm gonna switch the gear a little bit here, uh, turn it over to our non-state partners. So uh, both Margaret Pike uh, Trust and Blue Ventures are working primarily in the environmental and climate space and also have been commitment makers to EPI 2020 partnership since 2016 and 2017 respectively. So with the Margaret Pike Trust first, I'm gonna pose like a couple of questions. And my first question to David is, what has been the value to you of engaging in family planning partnership like EPI 2030? And what best practice uh, can you share from engaging with actors from other sectors on family planning commitments? Thank you, thanks for the opportunity. I mean, in that question, I really wanna focus on the, on the best practice part, I think. Um, because it's not just that we're primarily working in conservation and climate, we do a lot of traditional family planning work. We're training about 250 doctors in Uganda this week. But as well as that, we're being generally a genuinely cross-sectoral. So I think from a, a cross-sectoral perspective, there's four things I'd say for best practice. And firstly, I would encourage us all to be really open-minded. There are massive overlaps in rural areas where there's greatest barriers to family planning and where conservation organizations work. So we've got natural allies. We should remember that these conservation and climate organizations are also passionate about their communities. It's just that they might not necessarily know what to do from a health perspective. So we've got a lot of allies that we could bring in to actually build the family planning alliance. I think the second thing I would stress from a best practice point of view is to accept that we're very data driven, but so is the conservation and climate sector. But are we properly sharing the relevant data that we know that might help them come along with us? So they might not necessarily know what to do and they might not necessarily know what to do with us. Now, 
conservation and climate organizations don't want to run clinics any more than we don't want to run conservation projects. But we can use our knowledge and data to convince them to work with us. I think thirdly, from a best practice point of view, I'd also encourage us to, um, to think about our language because we're also very acronym driven. And the conservation and climate sector are too. And they haven't heard of SRHR, just like we might not have heard of IUCN. And one interesting example of this was talking with some conservation organizations when we were talking about communities. Now, I think we would all agree on what a community was. It means a group of people. But of course, in biology, a community actually means um, an area where there are one or more species living together. Now, this isn't a big deal, but we in our language started talking about human communities. A very simple word like community actually has a different meaning in different sectors. And part of cross-sectoral working and building the Family Planning Alliance requires us to be open-minded to learn about some of their language like we want them to be um, open-minded about us. And then I suppose the fourth point in all of our work is that we are relentlessly positive. We know that removing barriers to family planning is essential and always the right thing to do and advances many of the SDGs beyond number three and five. So we shouldn't be apologetic. We shouldn't say it's controversial to talk about this. This is always the right thing to do. So FP2020 was very helpful with us on one of our pieces of cross-sectoral work. Um, Blue Ventures, who you'll hear from in a moment, are also a member of the International Union for Conservation of Nature. And the Margaret Pike Trust is the only member of IUCN with 50 years family planning expertise. But part of our FB2020 commitment was to change global conservation policy. And we have done that with the support of Blue Ventures, FB2020 and others. So now yeah. it is global policy that um, our resolution that's titled the importance for the conservation of nature of removing barriers to voluntary and rights-based family planning is now in conservation policy. That's now enabling us to move on to the next steps, which is to reach donors, which would traditionally fund climate and environment to fund family planning. It's enabling us to access governments to see that environmental policy should also consider barriers to family planning. So I suppose that's my conclusion, is that best practice, good language, data sharing and partnerships with FP2020 and others, it is enabling us to try and build the family planning alliance rather than merely um, talking to the usual suspects and our allies. Thank you very much, David. That's really insp inspiring and insightful answer to the question. Uh, if uh, I may, I'd like to ask uh, another one more question to you, David. Uh, so as we learned earlier, EP2030 is, is increasing non-governmental commitment makers to online read government processes where relevant. You touched a little bit based on that, uh, but it's also welcome discrete commitments from our non-governmental commitment makers that can go beyond the commi government commitment, commitment. So how will that inform how you will be thinking about new commitments compared to uh, Margaret High Trust approach to which uh, IP2020 uh, commitment. Yeah, thanks. I mean, we've obviously already started thinking about our new commitment and I can't go into the detail of it, but it's very much going to focus more on our partnerships and our influence of others. And we work with so many organizations at the national level that are in climate and biodiversity that are broadly on board with all of the things we've been talking about today, learning about the importance of removing barriers to family planning. Now, we strongly believe that working with those national um, NGOs, that they can support their government's um, commitments and maybe help to encourage their governments to go beyond their commitments. So one of the things that, um, again, FP2020 has helped us with is we did an analysis of the national plans under the Convention on Biological Diversity of the 69 FP2020 focus countries. The overwhelming majority of those national plans prepared by the ministries of environment 
recognized that population growth was a big threat to biodiversity. But then they didn't go on to look at what the Ministry of Health knows, is that rather than that being a fatalistic fact, we can remove barriers to family planning. Now, we're hoping that working with our national partners, we can get some family planning language and policy changes and funding changes into other sectors to help actually, uh, as I say, broaden the Family Planning Alliance um, and get new partners, new donors and new policies that further our aims. Thank you very much, David. Uh, now I'm gonna invite Vic with uh, Bulu Ventures to ask us the same question actually, uh, to hear his insight. So Vic, are you on the line? Yes, I am. Hi, Thank Jackie. you. Thank you so much. I, I know you're having a back-to-back -back meetings uh, this morning, so thanks so much for joining uh, uh, with your busy schedule. So my first question to you, uh, Big, is what has been the value uh, to you of engaging in family planning partnership like EPI 2030, and what best practices can you share from engaging with actors from other sectors and family planning commitments? Sure, thank you. And hello, everybody. Um, and thank you again for inviting me. Firstly, I want to say thank you, David, for that for that those wonderful responses to your questions. What I what I'm going to say, I'm not sure I can I can match what you've shared already, David, but it very much echoes your perspective and experiences of this work. So, Blue Ventures is, is a marine conservation organisation, and we have 15 years of experience of integrating family planning services into our community-based conservation activities. And what and we do this because not only because addressing family planning needs is important in of itself, but also because it leads to greater, more inclusive, more resilient engagement in marine resource management and marine conservation. What communities tell us as a result of improvement in family planning access is that women and children are healthier, women are able to earn more money, and women are using our service earning twice as much money as non-users. Communities cite being more empowered, and communities cite being better able to um, and provide for their families and engage in that resource management. So as a result of that, we have been very excited to engage with FP2020 and now with FP2030. We are excited to be part of and contribute to this global movement to support universal access to family planning services, particularly for the, for the most difficult to reach. Um, as a marine conservation organization, this is wonderful for us to be part of because it gives us um, visibility within that movement, within that sector, and it gives us credibility as an actor in the family planning arena. And we can clearly articulate our added value, which is reaching some of the hardest to reach with family planning services, communities living in remote areas of high biodiversity in the, in the coastal tropics. In terms of best practice, um, um, our experiences and insights very much echo what David has shared. I think best practice starts with an understanding that we need you know, holistic, multi-sector approaches to tackling some of the world's most pressing problems. Okay? We need to think holistically if we're to solve these problems that we, that we all see and witness. Okay? And, and seeing, we need to see that we need a multi-sector response and we need to understand, appreciate and value the contribution of people from all those different sectors in order to, to, to create this multi-sector holistic response to the problems that we see. And as David has said, I think the answer lies in partnerships. Through the formation of partnerships between family planning providers and other sectors, we can create multi-sector solutions that really have a chance of solving some of the most difficult problems that we face. And those partnerships can be built on a shared vision for the communities that we serve and a shared set of values that inform the way we work and inform the way we engage with each other. And those partnerships, can leverage that complementarity to create real win-wins for communities and, and, for, and for our partners. So to give an example of that, what we see in Madagascar is that um, family planning organizations are forming partnerships with conservation organizations all over the country and, and to enable them to form holistic responses to, to the problems that communities face. And, and what, what that means is those family planning organizations can leverage the good community relations and operational infrastructure of those site-based conservation organizations to reach the hardest to reach with those family planning services, to reach the last mile, so, so that no one is left behind. And the conservation organizations benefit from being able to, to, to work with healthier, more engaged communities. 
So I really see that the partnership model for engaging with um, non family planning actors really provides a, a win-win opportunity for us. Thank you. Thank you very much, Vic. Uh, thank you for sharing your insight to be the country's best big examples uh, to help us un understand better. Uh, my second question is the same question that I posed to David. Uh, so we've been encouraging uh, non-governmental commitment makers to align with the government processes uh, where relevant and uh, also welcoming discrete commitments from our non-governmental commitment makers that can go beyond the uh, government commitments as well. Like how will that inform you? Uh, you are thinking about new commitments compared to Bullet Ventures uh, approach uh, in the EP2020 uh, commitments before. Sure. So um, with retrospect, with the benefit of hindsight, that we saw that in our excitement to become a commitment maker in FP 2020, we were a little bit blinkered in our thinking and we were a little bit siloed in, a, in our commitment making approach. And, and we see now that, that, that this much more integrated, joined up way of thinking provides us with an opportunity to to, more, to think more broadly and to fully integrate our, our commitment into national level or regional level com commitments and responses. You know, I mean, we see that's really important. A, because firstly, it'll enable us to better understand the commitment landscape within the regions which we operate. It will enable us to, to better coordinate um, responses from commitment makers to ensure that no one is left behind, to ensure that uh, resources are adequately dovetailed so we, so we are efficient with the use of our resources, and also will help us to articulate the added value of a commitment maker like us. And as I said, we work in remote areas of high biodiversity where communities have poor access to family planning quite typically. So we can support reaching the highest to reach with our services and that unique placement of us. And we can better articulate and understand once you understand the broader commitment making landscape. I hope that answers your question. Thanks. Yes, definitely. Thank you so much, Dr. Vic. Uh, it was really interesting to hear from uh, our two country partners and two non-state uh, partners. And uh, I'm pretty sure that all the participants could hear and also see the clear linkage on that, like the government commitments and the non-state uh, partners having a common goal in family planning and uh, reaching out to the unreached and ensuring that all the women and girls at the country uh, around the world have an access uh, to quality of family planning and it's which engages a multi, multi different sectoral um, kind of a collaboration that will be strengthened in the new partnership as well. So um, I'm gonna ask one common question to all four panel, if it's uh, okay. So my question is uh, how, what would be the piece of advice or innovations that you'd like to share with other countries about to begin their uh, recommitment process to EP2030. Any pan panelists who would like to share first? Maybe I can start, Chong? Yes, please. Um, I think there is a tendency for many people in places to wait on uh, government to outline what the process is uh, before take up, people take up the mantle. Our experience is that uh, a more proactive approach to even draft a roadmap, a draft roadmap and take it to the technical working group and take it to government that we think this process will give us the desired um, uh, objective we want. So instead of waiting for an announcement, be proactive, do a roadmap, even cost it where necessary, so that you are able to justify, for instance, I've read um, on this platform, people are saying, uh, how do we make sure that small organizations take part in these processes? We also know that cost limitations are one of the issues in this part of the world where valid uh, perspectives in what should inform certain policy processes are not on board because the people are not facilitated to be part of that process. So when you do a roadmap, you cost it, you present it, you justify different costs, including how certain, you know, not so economically powerful uh, groups can take part. I think for me, that, that would be a recommendation for everyone to follow. So don't wait, just, you know, lead from, from behind. So leading from, from the bottom. 
Thank you very much, Mr. Yoram. And being proactive is really powerful message to all of us uh, who'd like to go next. <clears throat> yeah, I agree with Zambia. You have to show stakeholders, especially government, business group, the roadmap, especially in our country. Uh, girls are a major workforce in our economic. They are the major drivers of of laborers and work in the Philippines. So if we do not show government that the teenage pregnancy is, uh, is a burden to economic, economic, uh, economic country, then they won't be convinced. As you know, the Philippines has one of the highest rate of sending laborers outside our country. Our uh, uh, overseas uh, foreign uh, overseas workers are mainly female. So it's very important that we show government stakeholders that if we invest to prevent teenage pregnancy, then we have a good, good, uh, good highly educated uh, generation of women able to decide for themselves and able to contribute to the economy. Thank you, Dr. Diego, and that's really uh, important insight as well. Uh, I, I saw Vic kind of unmuted yourself, like I would like to go next. Looks like David's ready to go. Why don't you jump in first, Dave? <laughs> yeah, since David, go ahead. <laughs> okay, well, I mean, we haven't finished our process yet, but uh, there's obviously lots of things that respond to the FP2030 agenda, which we are going to do anyway. What we're likely to do with our commitment is to commit to something that ties us closely to FP2030, where we can actually work with you to, to do more than we would otherwise have done. We are a relatively small NGO and we lack the government connections which FP2030 has. So we are going to frame our commitment in a way that actually means that we can continue to derive the benefit from the association with FP2030 in a way that drives your agenda and then can increase our voice. So I suppose that's our, that's our advice is rather than having a commitment which um, states what you're going to do anyway, to have a commitment that means that we're actually to do more than we would otherwise have done by sort of amplifying our voice. That's great. Uh, thank you, David. Uh, Vic. Thank you. I, I'm just, I think I'm just going to restate what I've already said, really, is that how are we going to leave nobody behind? How are we going to make sure everybody benefits from, from this initiative? Because, you know, because, you know, the, the last mile health is often the most expensive, they're the most expensive people to reach, but how do we make sure we, we don't forget them? And we need to think creatively about how we reach the hardest to reach. And we think the partnership model that David and I have been talking about provides a valuable example of how you can reach the hardest to reach. Okay? So let's think creatively about reaching everybody, about leaving no, no one behind. And that will almost by definition take us to working with non-conventional partners, conservation partners, climate partners, whatever, and think about how we can engage them because the benefits that planning planning will deliver for them and the communities that they serve. So for me, it's let's think creatively about reaching the last mile and think about how we can engage the partners that will support us on this journey for mutual benefit. Thank you very much. Then uh, I'm gonna turn it over to Onyine to wrap up. And thank you so much for all uh, four panelists for a powerful answer to those questions. Thank you. Yes, yes. Thank you all so much. Think creatively, think collaboratively, and be proactive. So um, I, I really can't say much more because our panelists have done a fantastic job. So we would like to just give a virtual round of applause to all of our country focal points and our non-state actor partners. Thank you all so much for being here and sharing the approaches that you are taking in making the new FP2030 commitments. And to our audience, we hope that these highlighted experiences have provided valuable insights to inform your processes. We know that some countries are just in the beginning phases of, of thinking through their roadmap. And uh, we want to encourage you to feel free to reach out to us at any point. If you want to learn more about country experiences, we're here to connect you to those resources. And we also have guidance on our website 
for country governments and also the non-state actors. So we really encourage you to go on the website, review the guidance, and of course, reach out to us with any questions you have. All right, we're getting to the, the end of this webinar, but we definitely don't want to leave audience members out of this conversation. So we will now open up the floor for your questions, because I know that we have gotten quite a few questions and we will do our best to get to as many as possible. My colleagues are standing by to respond. All right, so um, I'm just going to read out one question that we, we get often and we want to tackle this right on. There's a question about the commitment timeline. So Ramatu Daroda is asking, when should my commitments be developed and launched? And is there a deadline for commitments? I will hand over to my colleague Guillaume to provide a response. Very good question. Um... And uh, I'm very happy to respond. So FP2030 commitments will be um, accepted beginning um, late January 2021. We have already received um, draft commitments and we will continue to receive them and to accept them on a rolling basis uh, throughout the course of the partnership based on governance and other stakeholder timelines and priorities. So there is no deadline to develop your commitment and to launch your commitments. Uh, as a reminder, uh, it's important to remember that um, to reflect the importance of country-led and country-owned processes, partner governments are asked to announce their FP2030 commitments in country. Based on their commitment goals and organizational priorities, non-state non partners are highly encouraged to explore opportunities to announce their commitments in tandem with country partners. I hope it's helpful. Thank you so much, Guillaume. So we have another question from Andreas Hubers, and I apologize if I don't say your name incorrectly, kindly forgive me, but Andreas is asking, once governments, oh, I'm, okay, sorry, um, we'll, okay, once governments have launched locally, what are the channels, platforms, conferences, or international gatherings to get recognition for the efforts? And would these be open to donor governments and non-state actors as well? Uh, Oninia, should I take that question? Yes, please go ahead. <laughs> uh, thanks for the question, Andreas. So um, yes, we have lots of plans to amplify commitments that are launched um, nationally. Um, of course, first through the FP2030 communications and other platforms on our website, etc. But we are targeting a number of different um, events and milestones throughout 2021, um, where we can uh, celebrate commitments on a rolling basis. So some of those are, for example, the June Generation Equality Forum, we're looking at International Youth Day, uh, we're looking at World Contraception Day, uh, perhaps even the UN General Assembly, and creating other moments as, uh, as they come. Um, and we, may, we are hopefully uh, hoping to have a, a celebration event potentially at the end of the year. That depends on timing and um, how many um, commitments are, are launched. But um, we have many plans for um, celebrating those, those commitments. And we are um, hoping to celebrate the government commitments alongside our non-governmental commitments as well. Um, so we will be sharing more of the details about these key milestones in the coming days, but, but know that we have... Um, uh, many, many moments planned to celebrate commitments. Thank you so much, Dilly. And um, yes, so now we have another question on, um, but we would like to bring back our panelists from the Philippines, Dr. Diego, to respond to this question. It's a question from Priyanka Kocha, and she's asking, what were the challenges for the two departments in the Philippines coming come together? This is an important question because Hello. we're, yes, Dr. Diego, are you there? Yeah, uh, can you repeat the can you repeat yeah. the question again? Yes. Stable connection. Yes, sure. The question is, can you talk about so, any challenges for the two departments, the Ministry of Health and the Ministry of Education, coming together in this conversation about the new commitments? Yeah, uh, uh, one of the main challenges in our country, especially well, I'm, I'm talking about teenage pregnancy and adults in pregnancy is service delivery and commodities. It's a big challenge to us. You know, our country is a highly conservative country, a very religious country where religious, uh, religious is deeply embedded in, in every family. 
And one of the uh, challenges here is the freedom of teenage person, teenage, the teenage population to acquire commod uh, family planning commodities as they like. They need to have uh, consent from an elderly or from our parents and we all Doc, Dr. Diego, it seems we're having challenges with your line. You can try turning off your video in case that might help. Okay, all right, it seems we've lost Dr. Diego, but I know he, um, he, wants, he would probably want to finish what he was saying. So we would like to invite him back once he's able to connect again. We would go to the next question while we wait for Dr. Diego to join us so that my colleagues can respond. Is it a requirement um, to have the costed implementation plan before developing the 2030 commitments? I think we heard from our Zambian colleagues that they reviewed and developed a new CIP, but is this, does this have to be the case for all countries? I would ask my colleague Guillaume to respond to this if Guillaume is available. Thank you, Demier. Uh, so no, it, it is not a requirement uh, to have a CIP uh, in place before developing your um, recommitment to FP 2030. Although it's very important uh, to remember that uh, if you do have a CIP in place, um, commitments should ideally align with the country's other global and national uh, frameworks, including your costed implementation plan. So please make sure to review what's already in your CIP if you have one. It should inform your recommitment process. And I think maybe my colleague Martin Smith um, can add to my, to my response. Thank you. No, absolutely, Guillaume, and, and uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. Um, absolutely clear, um, CIPs can help set, uh, set the course for your commitments. By no means are they uh, uh, critical. Of course, many of the new commitment-making countries uh, for FP2030 that didn't make commitments in the FP2020 era uh, won't have those CIPs in place, and those costed implementation plans can then serve as the roadmap um, for how the uh, commitment itself is going to be achieved. But that key integration uh, with cost and implementation plans and other key strategic documents in country uh, is an important element of the um, country government uh, commitment process and is clearly articulated uh, in the toolkit guidance that uh, Chong He set out for us earlier. Thanks very much and back to you, Onyanye. Thank you, Martin and Guillaume. All right, I think Dr. Diego is back with us. Dr. Diego, are you there? We want you to have a chance to finish what you yeah, were saying. Yeah, okay. yeah, sorry, sorry about that. Uh, we had an unstable, uh, usually in this time of the night, we have a stable internet here where everybody's using the internet. Okay, uh, the question here is, what is the limiting factor or challenges in reducing our teenage pregnancy, am I right? No, oh, no, so the question is the challenge in um, getting the Department of Education and to work with the Department of Health in, oh, in, okay. in achieving yeah. their family planning goals. Yes, so can you talk about- Actually, the there's no problem, yeah. Yeah, okay. Actually, there's no problem. We're uh, in partner already and we uh, deem it possible, and we have already uh, uh, think about it, that education plays a factor. Education, information, peer counseling plays a factor in preventing teenage pregnancy. And we surmise that it will take 70% to 80% really can, can, can educate our teenagers about sexual reproductive health, the do's and the don'ts. So I, I would uh, answer it uh, directly that in terms of <clears throat> partnership, we don't see any problem with the Department of Education. In fact, uh, all our policies, all our uh, orders are being followed by them and they translate it into their own uh, policies and streamline down to the all public schools and private schools. So there's no problem with us with the Department of Education. We work perfectly fine. 
Thank you so much. It's really great to hear that um, there is that collaboration between the different uh, ministries because we're definitely encouraging more sectors, um, intersectoral engagement, because yes, family planning is everybody's business um, and, and education is really key in advancing health goals. All right, I see um, our panelists, our focal point, Yoram has his hand up and I think he wants to comment about the CIP. Go ahead, Yoram. Yes, please. Um, thank you. Having engaged with different countries, both those who have a CIP and those who don't, uh, it is quite clear that countries who have a CIP have benefited in terms of the ease with which advocacy and accountability can happen. I would uh, go further to add to what was submitted by the two uh, gentlemen by saying, uh, as civil society, it would be good if your country doesn't have a CIP to even push that a commitment should be that a CIP will be de developed. For me, if your country doesn't have a CIP or if you sense that it will be a problem, um, for me, it's a good idea to include that because eventually there is an opportunity after the CIP is developed and that commitment is realized that uh, as we saw with um, FP 2030, that annually or uh, after a certain period, additional commitments can be made depending on the new emerging issues which come up. Mm -hmm. So some of the issues which are about financing and commodities and task shifting and other pieces of the puzzle which are needed to support a CIP can be made in subsequent uh, commitments or recommitments as we were calling them in the uh, previous, uh, in FP2020. I thank you. Yes, thank you so much, Yoram. Very key additions that you made. Um, so thank you very much. All right, um, we, I think we have time for a couple more questions and we really want to get to this question on accountability. So Evelyn Samba is asking, are there reporting and accountability mechanisms in place after the commitment launches? I would like to invite my colleague Monday to respond to this question. Thank you so much, um, Onyinye. So as Dilly mentioned earlier on, um, accountability is um, definitely at the heart of the commitment process. Uh, first, we're establishing a robust commitment making process that strengthens the role of civil society, including our youth partners. And that requires a framework for mutual accountability from the start. So. Um, as you can see in the guidance, we are asking countries to share their accountability frameworks uh, as part of their commitments um, in the commitment form. And in this guidance, we've also included uh, some key elements and, and guidelines for countries' considerations and a number of examples that countries uh, could adopt based on uh, their contents. So this guidance is informed by lessons, uh, many lessons as far as uh, tracking commitments to accountability efforts that we've learned in the uh, FP2020 partnerships. Um, again, the examples are recommendations based on um, countries' context, uh, people uh, can feel free to either design new mechanisms if they didn't have one um, in place or just strengthen the existing uh, mechanisms and, and hopefully um, expand those to sub-national levels and align with existing frameworks for tracking other commitments such as ICPD 25, GFS and others. So just also wanted to mention that we'll be facilitating uh, office hours in the coming coming weeks uh, to discuss more about accountability and support countries that are in the process of uh, designing their accountability framework. So feel free to um, reach out to us if you have any specific questions that you would want us to cover uh, during the office hours. Thank you. Yes, thank you so much, Mande. And thank you all for the great interaction and your questions are really great. I want to um, let you know that we won't be able to get through all of the questions because I believe we only have time for one more question, but we will be following up and responding to your questions. We have a FAQs section on, um, in the guidance document on the website. So we will be sure to add uh, many of these questions on there, but at any point, feel free to email us. You have um, your regional team's email addresses. You can always um, email through the info at family planning email address, but um, we really value your questions and we will do our best to respond after this webinar. But for the last question, we would like to discuss of course the, I guess maybe we'll call it the elephant in the room, COVID-19 and FP. 
and FP in our country. So Halima Abba Ali Zaid is asking, with the impact of COVID-19 pandemic, do we foresee new players joining the core partners in addressing the FP 2030 commitment work? And how will we all move towards mutual accountability for the FP 2030 commitments? I think I will ask my colleague either um, Dilly or Mande to respond or anyone really from the team who wants to respond to how do we ensure other partners come in? And I know that our non-state actors touched on this in terms of climate. Yeah, so Anina, maybe Monday and I can tag team. I can um, answer the first half and maybe Monday can talk about some of the work that's moving on the uh, accountability framework for the partnership. Um, so it's a good question. I, I think you've heard... Um, um, it mentioned a few times that there is not a, a set timeline for commitments uh, to the FP2030 partnership. And one of the main reasons for that is the reality of COVID. Um, we, we recognized and got feedback from both our government commitment makers as well as our non-governmental commitment makers that the, the constraints and the realities of COVID mean that it's it's a very different environment within which that they are making commitments. So one of the ways that we are adjusting to that is one through through the timeline and having commitments come on a rolling basis versus setting up um, a, a strict timeline that that would somehow uh, be unrealistic for for commitment makers. Um, the second piece uh, is yes, we a, a key goal um, of this 2030 partnership is to deepen relationships with other sectors that's consistent with the sustainable development goals. It's a statement, it's, it's consistent with the universal health um, coverage agenda, but also um, as everyone has reflected, as our um, non-governmental actors have, have reflected as well, it really is what's required to respond to the moment right now um, in terms of an all sector and multi sector engagement approach to commitments. Um, we expect with the new opt in model for the partnership that we will have new actors in terms of new governments who um, previously would not have made commitments to FP 2030 before um, being part of the partnership. But we also expect new types of um, non governmental um, commitment makers to, to be a part of that as well, those at the global level, but also. So those at the national and regional level. So in short, yes to that. I'll turn over to Mande to, to talk more about accountability and some of the work there. Thank you, Dili. Um, just to add on that, I just want to quickly talk about how um, we are working to ensure participation of civil society partners. Um, as you all know, in uh, many countries in the previous commitments process, uh, the process was largely driven by governments, uh, but this time around, we're really trying to leverage support for civil society partners and, and youth focal points. And a good example is the work that Zambia is doing that Yoram just presented to us and just making sure that all the key stakeholders, including the non-traditional uh, family planning partners are um, involved in the commitment pr making process and they're involved at all stages of the, of the process. So we're in the process of working with uh, a number of partners to provide both financial and technical support uh, for commitment making countries that have already started their process uh, to, to make sure that um, we strengthen um, engagement of all key partners, both at the national level and subnational level this time around. Thank you so much. And we're at time. Um, thank you all so much for a very interactive conversation. I would like to invite Martin Smith, our managing director, to close us out. Thank you all again. Thanks uh, very much, Sean Yinye. Um, we're at time, so I hope the webinar isn't going to close on me. But uh, I have just a few comments in three areas, a uh, few key messages from the panel, a couple of quick points on the toolkit, and then uh, and then one or two very general points, which I'll do very fast. Thanks so much uh, to the panelists. A very clear um, message from Yoram from the Zambia process, a highly consultative process, uh, one that is really taking account of, of other strategic uh, frameworks, in, including the, uh, the costed implementation plan. And that message from Yoram to be proactive, I think, came through very clearly. Great to hear from Dr. Diego on this cross-ministerial collaboration around uh, adolescent and teen pregnancy uh, and the work around that issue that is gonna form a central part, it seems, of the uh, Philippines FP 
2030 commitment. Very inspiring indeed. Uh, great to hear from David, uh, those messages about being open-minded um, to allies in rural areas and the overlapping issues that those communities, communities in the broadest sense are facing. Uh, his message to make sure the data comes together very clearly heard. And then Vic's point about partnerships being crucial to all of this, but they need to be based around, around uh, shared values and a shared uh, vision. So those key messages from the panel really really hit me very strongly and I, 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 I hope you enjoyed it. It certainly brought the issues to life uh, as far as I was concerned. Uh, the toolkit guidance is available right now as uh, Chong Hee and uh, Dilly have let you know, but the key guidance around adolescents and young people is brand new and is there as of this moment. It's, uh, it's an excellent set of guidance that I do really urge you uh, in thinking about bold and transformative adolescents and young people related commitments that you go there and, and look at that guidance. Next week, our emergency preparedness and resilience guidance will be published and further thematic guidance is coming up on financing, postpartum, post-abortion family planning, um, supply chain strengthening and a range of other thematic areas uh, in the very near future. And as Mande and Chong Hee have said, we will have some special sessions, some office hours around key thematic areas of the guidance uh, including the accountability piece that will be coming up where you will be invited. Uh, so stand by for more information there. Just a couple of other points in closing. Firstly, for those of you who posed questions where those questions were not able to be fully answered in that great Q&A session that Onyinye took us through a moment ago, we will be following up with you and we welcome further questions as Onyinye reminded you all. Um, we do, of course, have this specific outreach that we'll be doing as a team. Uh, our country support team will be in touch with, uh, with country commitment makers. Our global initiatives team will be doing the same uh, with our non-governmental commitment makers as well. So stand by for that outreach and for that close uh, work together. I'd like to sincerely thank uh, all of the uh, panelists, um, the speakers, my FP2030 secretariat colleagues, but really to thank all of you uh, who joined us uh, whatever hour of the morning afternoon, evening, uh, it is for you. And, and just to repeat that we're all together in this work, of course, this partnership, we've shown ourselves to be a strong, resilient, creative community uh, over the last eight years, but particularly over the last 12 months, I would say. And I think we enter the next decade very clear eyed about the challenges that face us, including the continued pandemic and the, the significant work that still needs to be done in our, uh, in our, in our mission together. And these commitments really allow us to set an inspiring course in the service of women and girls and our 2030 vision. And we're very excited to be embarking upon this next stage of the journey with all of you. So having said all of that, sincere thanks to everyone and uh, we'll be in touch and enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you.